Hello, friends of the podcast, and for our Canadian listeners out there, happy Thanksgiving. I'm your host, Cam, for a very special episode here at Inconceivable Media. I've been kicking around an idea for a little while, and uh, now I'm going to execute it. And that would be, uh, as we dig into more written forms of media to review, I am trying to make them a little bit more presentable, perhaps for those of us in the audience that might not have the time to read something. And while this is, again, like very, very bonus content, we are going to be doing an episode on The Thing, the film by John Carpenter. And that film is adapted from a novella written in the 30s called Who Goes There, written by John W. Campbell. So what, I'm, what we are going to be doing today is that I am going to be reading Who Goes There. Now, since it is a novella, I'm going to be breaking it up into parts, since I'm sure as many of you out there love the sound of my voice, I don't know if you want to listen to my voice for two plus hours all at once. And I could probably use a break too, so I will be doing it in at least two parts, and they will be uploaded every week before we get to the thing, just so that everyone has a bit of a broader understanding of the story that the thing came from. So, let's read on, shall we? Chapter 1 The place stank, a queer, mingled stench that only the ice-buried cabins of an Antarctic camp know, compounded of reeking human sweat and the heavy fish-oil stench of melted seal blubber. An overtone of liniment combated the musty smell of sweat and snow-drenched furs, the acrid odor of burnt cooking fat, and the animal, not unpleasant smell of dogs, diluted by time, hung in the air. Lingering odors of machine oil contrasted sharply with the taint of harness dressing and leather. Yet somehow, through all that reek of human beings and their associates, dogs, machines, and cooking, came another taint. It was a queer, neck-ruffling thing, a faintest suggestion of an odor alien among the smells of industry and life. And it was a life smell, but it came from the thing that lay bound with cord and tarpaulin on the table, dripping slowly, methodically onto the heavy planks, dank and gaunt under the unshielded glare of the electric light. Blair, the little bald-pated biologist of the expedition, twitched nervously at the wrappings, exposing clear, dark ice beneath, and then pulling the tarpaulin back into place restlessly. His little bird-like motions of suppressed eagerness danced his shadow across the fringe of dingy gray underwear hanging from the low ceiling, the equatorial fringe of stiff, grain hair around his naked skull, a comical halo about the shadow's head. Commander Gary brushed aside the lax legs of a suit of underwear and stepped toward the table. Slowly, his eyes traced around the rings of men sardined into the administration building. His tall, stiff body straightened finally, and he nodded, 37. All here. His voice was low, yet carried the clear authority of the commander by nature, as well as by title. You know the outline of the story of that find of the secondary pole expedition. I have been conferring with second-in-command McCready and Norris, as well as Blair and Dr. Copper. There is a difference of opinion, and because it involves the entire group, it is only just that the entire expedition personnel act on it. I am going to ask McCready to give you the details of the story, because each of you has been too busy with his own work to follow closely the endeavors of the others. MacReady? Moving from the smoke-blue background, MacReady was a figure from some forgotten myth, a looming bronze statue that held life and walked. Six feet four inches he stood as he halted beside the table, and, with a characteristic glance upward to assure himself of room under the lower ceiling beam, straightened. His rough, clashingly orange, windproof jacket he still had on, yet on his huge frame it did not seem misplaced. Even here, 
four feet beneath the drift wind that droned across the Antarctic waste above the ceiling, the cold of the frozen continent leaked in and gave meaningness to the harshness of the man. And he was bronze, his great red bronze beard, the heavy hair that matched it, the gnarled corded hands gripping, relaxing, gripping, relaxing on the table planks were bronze. Even the deep sunken eyes beneath heavy brows were bronzed. Age-resisting endurance of the metal spoke in the cragged heavy outlines of his face and the mellow tones of the heavy voice. Norris and Blair agree on one thing. That animal we found was not terrestrial in origin. Norris fears there may be danger in that. Blair says there is none. But I'll go back to how and why we found it. To all that was known before we came here, it appeared that this point was exactly over the south magnetic pole of Earth. The compass does point straight down here, as you all know. The more delicate instruments of the physicists, instruments especially designed for this expedition, and its study of the magnetic pole detected a secondary effect, a secondary, less powerful magnetic influence about 80 miles southwest of here. The secondary magnetic expedition went out to investigate it. There is no need for details. We found it, but it was not the huge meteorite or magnetic mountain Norris had expected to find. Iron ore is magnetic, of course, iron more so, and certain special steels even more magnetic from the surface indications. The secondary pole we found was small, so small that the magnetic effect it had was preposterous. No magnetic material conceivable could have that effect. Soundings through the ice indicated it was within 100 feet of the glacier surface. I think you should know the structure of the place. There is a broad plateau, a level sweep that runs more than 150 miles due south from the secondary station, Van Wall says. He didn't have time or fuel to fly farther, but it was running smoothly due south then. Right there, where that buried thing was, there is an ice-drowned mountain ridge a granite wall of unshakable strength that has dammed back the ice creeping from the south. And 400 miles due south is the South Polar Plateau. You have asked me at various times why it gets warmer here when the wind rises, and most of you know. As a meteorologist, I'd have staked my word that no wind could blow at minus 70 degrees, that no more than a 5-mile wind could blow at minus 50 without causing warming due to friction with ground, snow, and ice, and the air itself. We camped there on the lip of that ice-drowned mountain range for 12 days. We dug out camp into the blue ice that formed the surface and escaped most of it. But for 12 consecutive days, the wind blew at 45 miles an hour. It went as high as 48 and fell to 41 at times. The temperature was minus 63 degrees. It rose to minus 60 and fell to minus 68. It was meteorologically impossible, and it went on uninterruptedly for 12 days and 12 nights. Somewhere to the south, the frozen air of South Polar Plateau slides down from that 18,000-foot bowl, down a mountain pass over a glacier, and starts north. There must be a funneling mountain chain that directs it, and sweeps it away for 400 miles to hit that bald plateau where we found the secondary pole and 350 miles further north reaches the Antarctic Ocean. It's been frozen there since Antarctica froze 20 million years ago. There never has been a thaw there. 20 million years ago, Antarctica was beginning to freeze. We've investigated, thought, and built speculations. What we believe happened was about like this. Something came down out of space, a ship. We saw it there in the blue ice, a thing like a submarine with a conning tower or directive vanes, 280 feet long and 45 feet in diameter at its thickest. A eh, Van Wall? Space? Yes, but I'll explain that better later, McCready's steady voice went on. It came down from space, driven and lifted by forces men haven't discovered yet, and somehow, perhaps something went wrong then, it tangled with Earth's magnetic field. It came south here, out of control, probably, circling the magnetic pole. That's a savage country there, but when Antarctica was still freezing, it must have been a thousand times more savage. 
There must have been blizzard snow as well as drift, new snow falling as the continent glaciated. The swirl there must have been particularly bad, the wind hurling a solid blanket of white over the lip of that now-buried mountain. The ship struck solid granite head-on and cracked up. Not every one of the passengers in it was killed, but the ship must have been ruined, her driving mechanism locked. It tangled with Earth's field, Norris believes. No thing made by intelligent beings can tangle with the dead immensity of a planet's natural forces and survive. One of its passengers stepped out. The wind we saw there never fell below 41, and the temperature never rose above minus 60. Then, the wind must have been stronger, and there was drift falling in a solid sheet. The thing was co lost completely in ten paces. He paused for a moment, the deep, steady voice giving way to the drone of wind overhead and the uneasy, malicious gurgling in the pipe of the galley stove. Drift. A drift wind was sweeping by overhead. Right now the snow picked up by the mumbling wind fled in level, blinding lines across the face of the buried camp. If a man stepped out of the tunnels that connected each of the camp buildings beneath the surface, he'd be lost in ten paces. Out there, the slim, black finger of the radio mast lifted 300 feet into the air, and at its peak was the clear night sky, a sky of thin, whining wind rushing steadily from beyond to another beyond under the licking, curling mantle of the aurora, and off north the horizon flamed with queer, angry colors of the midnight twilight. That was spring, 300 feet above Antarctica. At the surface, it was white death, death of a needle-fingered coal driven before the wind, sucking heat from any warm thing, cold and white mist of endless, everlasting drift, the fine, fine particles of licking snow that obscured all things. Kinner, the little scar-faced cook, winced. Five days ago, he had stepped out to the surface to reach a cache of frozen beef. He had reached it, started back, and the drift wind leapt out of the south. Cold, white death that streamed across the ground blinded him in twenty seconds. He stumbled on wildly in circles. It was half an hour before rope-guided men from below found him in the impenetrable murk. It was easy for man, or thing, to get lost in ten paces. And the drift wind then was probably more impenetrable than we know, MacReady's voice snapped Kinner's mind back, back to welcome dank warmth of the ad building. The passenger of the ship wasn't prepared either, it appears. It froze within ten feet of the ship. We dug down to find the ship, and our tunnel happened to find the frozen animal. Barclay's ice axe struck its skull. When we saw what it was, Barclay went back to the tractor, started the fire up, and when the steam pressure built, sent a call for Blair and Dr. Copper. Barclay himself was sick then, stayed sick for three days as a matter of fact. When Blair and Copper came, we cut out the animal in a block of ice, as you see, wrapped it, and loaded it onto the tractor for return here. We wanted to get into that ship. We reached the side and found the metal was something we didn't know. Our beryllium bronze, non-magnetic tools wouldn't touch it. Barclay had some tool steel on the tractor, and that wouldn't scratch it either. We made reasonable tests, even tried some acid from the batteries with no results. They must have had a passivating process to make magnesium metal resist acid that way, and the alloy must have been at least 95% magnesium. But we had no way of guessing that, so when we spotted the barely open locked door, we cut around it. There was clear, hard ice out inside the lock where we couldn't reach it. Through the little crack, we could look in and see that only metal and tools were in there. So we decided to loosen the ice with a bomb. We had deconite bombs and thermite. Thermite is the ice softener. Deconite might have shattered valuable things, where the thermite's heat would just loosen the ice. Dr. Copper, Norris, and I placed a 25-pound thermite bomb, wired it, and took the connector up the tunnel to the surface, where Blair had the steam tractor waiting. A hundred yards the other side of that granite wall, we set off the thermite bomb. The magnesium metal of the ship caught, of course. 
The glow of the bomb flared up and died, then it began to flare again. We ran back to the tractor, and gradually the glare built up. From where we were, we could see the whole ice field illuminated from beneath with an unbearable light. The ship's shadow was a great dark cone reaching off toward the north, where the twilight was just about gone. For a moment, it lasted, and we counted three other shadow things that might have been other passengers frozen there. Then the ice was crashing down against the ship. That's why I told you about that place. The wind sweeping down from the pole was at our backs. Steam and hydrogen flame were torn away in the white ice fog. The flaming heat under the ice there was yanked away toward the Antarctic Ocean before it touched us. Otherwise, we wouldn't have come back, even with the shelter of that granite ridge that stopped the light. Somehow, in the blinding inferno, we could see great hunched things, black bulks glowing, even so. They shed even the furious incandescence of the magnesium for a time. Those must have been the engines, we knew. Secrets going in blazing glory, secrets that might have given man the planets. Mysterious things that could lift and hurl that ship, and had soaked in the force of the Earth's magnetic field. I saw Norris's mouth move and ducked. I couldn't hear him. Insulation something gave way. All Earth's field they'd soaked up 20 million years before broke loose. The aurora in the sky above licked down, and the whole plateau there was bathed in cold fire that blanketed vision. The ice axe in my hand got red hot and hissed on the ice. Metal buttons on my clothes burned into me, and a flash of electric blue seared upward from beyond the granite wall. Then the walls of ice crashed down on it. For an instant it squealed the way dry ice does when it's pressed in between metal. We were blind and groping in the dark for hours while our eyes recovered. We found every coil within a mile was fused rubbish. The dynamo and every radio set, the earphones and speakers. If we hadn't had the steam tractor, we wouldn't have gotten over to the secondary camp. Van Wall flew in from Big Magnet and Sunup, as you know. We came home as soon as possible. That is the history of that. McCready's great bronze beard gestured towards the thing on the table. Chapter 2 Blair stirred uneasily, his little bony fingers wriggling under the harsh light. Little brown freckles on his knuckles slid back and forth as the tendons under the skin twitched. He pulled aside a bit of the tarpaulin and looked impatiently at the dark, ice-bound thing inside. McCready's big body straightened somewhat. He'd written the rocking, jarring steam tractor 40 miles that day, pushing on to Big Magnet here. Even his calm will had been pressed by the anxiety to mix again with humans. It was lone and quiet out there in secondary camp, where a wolf wind howled down from the pole. Wolf wind howling in his sleep, winds droning and the evil, unspeakable face of that monster leering up as he'd first seen it through clear, blue ice with a bronze ice axe buried in its skull. The giant meteorologist spoke again. The problem is them. Blair wants to examine the thing, thaw it out, and make microslides of its tissues and so forth. Norris doesn't believe that it is safe, and Blair does. Dr. Cooper agrees pretty much with Blair. Norris is a physicist, of course, not a biologist. But he makes a point I think we should all hear. Blair has described the microscopic life forms biologists find living even in this cold and inhospitable place. They freeze every winter and thaw every summer for three months and live. The point Norris makes is they thaw and live again. There must have been microscopic life associated with this creature. There is with every living thing we know. And Norris is afraid that we may release a plague, some germ disease unknown to Earth. If we thaw those microscopic things that have been frozen there for 20 million years. Blair admits that such microlife might retain the power of living. Such unorganized things as individual cells can retain life for unknown periods when solidly frozen. The beast itself is as dead as those frozen mammoths they find in Siberia. 
organized, highly developed life forms can't stand that treatment. But microlife could. Norris suggests that we may release some disease form that man, never having met it before, will be utterly defenseless against. Blair's answer is that there may be such still living germs, but that Norris has the case reversed. They are utterly non-immune to man. Our life chemistry probably. Probably, the little biologist had lifted in a quick bird-like motion. A halo of gray hair about his bald head ruffled as though angry. Ha! One look! I know, McCready acknowledged, the thing is not earthly. It does not seem likely that it can have a life chemistry sufficiently like ours to make cross-infection remotely possible. I would say that there is no danger. McCready looked toward Dr. Copper. The physician shook his head slowly. None whatever, he asserted confidently. Man cannot infect or be infected by germs that live in such comparatively close relatives as the snakes. And they are, I assure you, his clean-shaven face grimaced uneasily, much nearer to us than that. Vance Norris moved angrily. He was comparatively short in this gathering of big men, some five feet eight, and his stocky, powerful build tended to make him seem shorter. His black hair was crisp and hard like short steel wires, and his eyes were the gray of fractured steel. If MacReady was a man of bronze, Norris was all steel. His movements, his thoughts, his whole bearing had the quick, hard impulse of steel spring. His nerves were steel, hard, quick-acting, swift, corroding. He was decided on his point now, and he lashed out in its defense with a characteristic quick-clip flow of words. Different chemistry be damned! That thing may be dead, or by God it may not, but I don't like it. Damn it, Blair! Let them see the foul thing and decide for themselves whether they want that thing thought out in this camp. Thought out? By the way, that's got to be thought out in one of the shacks tonight. If it is thought out, somebody... Who's Watchman tonight? Magnetic... Oh, Conet... Cosmic Rays tonight? Well, you get to sit up with that 20 million year old mummy of his. Unwrap it, Blair. How the hell can they tell what they are buying if they can't see it? It may have a different chemistry. I don't know what else it has, but I know it has something I don't want. If you can judge by the look on its face, it isn't human, so maybe you can't. It was annoyed when it froze. Annoyed, in fact, is just about as close an approximation of the way it felt as crazy, mad, insane hatred. Neither one touches the subject. How the hell can these birds tell what they're voting on? They haven't seen those three red eyes and the blue hair like crawling worms. Crawling. Damn, it's crawling there in the ice right now. Nothing... Earth ever spawned had the unutterable sublimation of devastating wrath that thing let loose in its face when it looked around this frozen desolation 20 million years ago. Mad? It was mad clear through, searing, blistering mad. Hell, I've had bad dreams ever since I looked at those three red eyes. Nightmares. Dreaming the thing thawed out and came to life that it wasn't dead or even wholly unconscious all those 20 million years ago, but just slowed, waiting, waiting. You'll dream too, while that damn thing that Earth wouldn't own is dripping, dripping in the cosmos house tonight. And con it, Norris whipped toward the cosmic ray specialist. Won't you have fun sitting up all night in the quiet, wind whining above and that thing dripping? He stopped for a moment and looked around. I know. That's not science, but this is. It's psychology. You'll have nightmares for a year to come. Every night since I looked at that thing, I've had them. That's why I hate it. Sure I do, and don't want it around. Put it back where it came from and let it freeze for another 20 million years. I had some swell nightmares that it wasn't made like we are, which is obvious, but of a different kind of flesh that it can really control, that it can change its shape and look like a man and wait to kill and eat. That's not a logical argument. I know it isn't. The thing isn't Earth logic anyway. Maybe it has an alien body chemistry, and maybe its bugs do have a different body chemistry. A germ might not stand that, but Blair and Copper, how about a virus? 
That's just an enzyme molecule, you said. That wouldn't need anything but a protein molecule on anybody to work on. And how are you so sure that of the million varieties of microscopic life it may have, none of them are dangerous? How about diseases like hydrophobia, rabies, that attacks any warm-blooded creature, whatever its body chemistry may be? And parrot fever, have you a body like a parrot player? And plane rot, gangrene, necrosis, do you want? That isn't choosy about body chemistry. Blair looked up from his puttering long enough to meet Norris's angry gray eyes for an instant. So far, the only thing you've said this thing gave off that was catching was dreams. I'll go so far as to admit that. An impish, slightly malignant grin crossed the little man's seamed face. I had some too. So, it's dream infectious. No doubt, an exceedingly dangerous malady. So far as your other things go, you have a badly mistaken idea about viruses. In the first place, nobody has shown that the enzyme molecule theory, and that alone, explains them. And in the second place, when you catch tobacco mosaic or wheat rust, let me know. A wheat plant is a lot nearer your body chemistry than this otherworld creature is. And your rabies is limited, strictly limited. You can't get it from nor give it to a wheat plant or a fish, which is a collateral descendant of a common ancestor of yours, which this, Norris, is not. Blair nodded pleasantly toward the tarpaulined bulk on the table. Well, thaw the damn thing in a tub of formalin if you must thaw it. I've suggested that. And I've said there would be no sense in that. You can't compromise. Why did you and Commander Gary come down here to study magnetism? Why weren't you content to stay at home? There's magnetic force enough in New York. I could no more study the life this thing once had from a formal and pickled sample than you could get the information you wanted back in New York. And if this one is so treated, never in all time to come can there be a duplicate. The race it came from must have passed away in the 20 million years it lay frozen, so that even if it came from Mars, then we'd never find its like. And the ship is gone. There's only one way to do this, and that is the best possible way. It must be thawed slowly, carefully, and not in formalin. Commander Gary stood forward again, and Nora stepped back muttering angrily. I think Blair is right, gentlemen. What do you say? Conan grunted. It sounds right to us, I think. Only perhaps he ought to stand watch over it while it's thawing. He grinned ruefully, brushing a stray lock of ripe cherry hair back from his forehead. Swell idea. In fact, if he sits up with his jolly little corpse. Gary smiled slightly. A general chuckle of agreement rippled over the group. I should think any ghost it may have had would have starved to death if it hung around here that long, Conant, Gary suggested. And you look capable of taking care of it. Iron Man Conant ought to be able to take out any opposing players. Still, Conant shook himself uneasily. I'm not worrying about ghosts. Let's see that thing. I eagerly, Blair was stripping back the ropes. A single throw of the tarpaulin revealed the thing. The ice had melted somewhat in the heat of the room, and it was clear and blue as thick, good glass. It shone wet and sleek under the harsh light of the unshielded globe above. The room stiffened abruptly. It was face up there on the plain, greasy planks of the table. The broken half of the frozen ice axe was still buried in the queer skull. Three mad, hate-filled eyes blazed up with a living fire, bright as fresh spilled blood from a face ringed with a writhing loathsome nest of worms, blue, mobile worms that crawled where hair should grow. Van Wall, six feet and 200 pounds of ice nerve pilot, gave a queer, strangled gasp and butted, stumbled his way out to the corridor. Half the company broke for the doors. The others stumbled away from the table. McCready stood at one end of the table watching them, his great body planted solid on his powerful legs. Norris from the opposite end glowered at the thing with smoldering heat. Outside the door, 
Gary was talking with a half dozen of the men at once. Blair had a tack hammer. The ice that cased the thing slurfed crisply under its steel claw as it peeled from the thing it had cased for 20,000 years. Chapter 3 I know you don't like the thing, Conant, but it just has to be thought out right. You say leave it as it is till we get back to civilization. All right, I'll admit your argument that we could do a better and more complete job there is sound, but how are we going to get this across the line? We have to take this through one temperate zone, the equatorial zone, and halfway through the other temperate zone before we get it to New York. You don't want to sit with it one night, but you suggest then that I hang its corpse in the freezer with the beef? Blair looked up from his cautious chipping, his bald, freckled skull nodding triumphantly. Kinner, the stocky, scar-faced cook, saved Conant the trouble of answering, Hey, you listen, mister. You put that thing in the box with the meat, and by all the gods there ever were, I'll put you in to keep it company. You birds have brought everything movable in this camp in onto my mess tables here already, and I had to stand for that. But you go putting things like that in my meat box, or even my meat cashier, and you cook your own damn grub. But Kinner, this is the only table in Big Magnet that's big enough to work on, Blair objected. Everybody's explained that. Yeah, and everybody's brought everything in here. Clark brings his dogs every time there's a fight and sews them up on that table. Ralston brings in his sledges. Hell, the only thing you haven't had on the table is the Boeing. And you'd have had that in if you could have figured a way to get it through the tunnels. Commander Gary chuckled and grinned at Van Wall, the huge chief pilot. Van Wall's great blond beard twitched suspiciously as he nodded gravely to Kinner. <laughs> eh, you're right, Kinner. The aviation department is the only one that treats you right. It does get crowded, Kinner, Gary acknowledged, but I'm afraid we all find it that way at times. Not much privacy in an Antarctic camp. Privacy? The hell's that? You know, the thing that really made me weep was when I saw Barkley marching through here chanting, the last lumber in the camp, the last lumber in the camp, and carrying it out to build that house on his tractor. Damn it, I missed that moon cut in the door he carried out more and I missed the sun when it set. That wasn't just the last lumber Barkley was walking off with. He was carrying off the last bit of privacy in this blasted place. A grin rode even on Conant's heavy face as Kinner's perennial good-natured grouch came up again, but it died away quickly as his dark, deep-set eyes turned again to the red-eyed thing Blair was chipping from its cocoon of ice. A big hand roughed his shoulder-length hair and tugged at a twisted lock that fell behind his ear in a familiar gesture. I know that Cosmic Ray Shack's going to be too crowded if I have to sit up with that thing, he growled. Why can't you go on chipping the ice away from around it? You can do that without anybody butting in, I assure you. And then hang the thing up over the power plant boiler. That's warm enough. It'll thaw out a chicken, even a whole side of beef in a few hours. I know, Blair protested. Pro I know. Blair protested, dropping the tack hammer to gesture more effectively with his bony, freckled fingers, his small body tense with eagerness. But this is too important to take any chances. There never was fine like this. There never can be again. It's the only chance men will ever have, and it has to be done exactly right. Look, you know how the fish we caught down near the Ross Sea would freeze almost as soon as we got them on deck and come to life again if we thawed them gently? Low forms of life aren't killed by quick freezing and slow thawing. We have, hey, for the love of heaven, you mean that damn thing will come to life? Conant yelled. You get the damn thing. Let me at it. That's going to be in so many pieces. No, no, you fool. Blair jumped in front of Conant to protect his precious find. No, just low forms of life. For Pete's sake, let me finish. You can't thaw higher forms of life and have them come to. Wait, wait a moment now. Hold it. A fish 
can come to after freezing because it's so low a form of life that the individual cells of its body can revive. And that alone is enough to reestablish life. Any higher forms thought out that way are dead. Though the individual cells revive, they die because there must be organization and cooperative effort to live. That cooperation cannot be reestablished. There is a sort of potential life in any uninjured, quick frozen animal, but it can't it can't under any circumstances become active life in higher animals. The higher animals are too complex, too delicate. This is an intelligent creature, as high in its evolution as we are in ours, perhaps higher. It is as dead as a frozen man would be. How do you know? demanded Connet, hefting the ice axe he had seized a moment before. Commander Gary laid a restraining hand on his heavy shoulder. Wait a minute, Connet. I want to get this straight. I agree that there is going to be no thawing of this thing if there is the remotest chance of its revival. I quite agree it is much too unpleasant to have alive, but I had no idea there was the remotest possibility. Dr. Copper pulled his pipe from between his teeth and heaved his stocky, dark body from the bunk he had been sitting in. Mm, Blair's being technical. That's dead. As dead as the mammoths they find frozen in Siberia. Potential life is like atomic energy there, but nobody can get it out and certainly won't release itself except in rare cases, as rare as radium in the chemical analogy. We have all sorts of proof that things don't live after being frozen, not even fish, generally speaking, and no proof that higher animal life can under any circumstances. What's the point, Blair? The little biologist shook himself. The little ruff of hair standing around his bald pate waved in righteous anger. The point is, he said in an injured tone, that the individual cells might show the characteristics they had in life, if it is properly thawed. A man's muscle cells live many hours after he has died. Just because they live, and a few things like hair and fingernail cells still live, you wouldn't accuse a corpse of being a zombie or something. Now, if I thaw this right, I may have a chance to determine what sort of world it's native to. We don't and can't know by any other means, whether it came from Earth or Mars or Venus or from beyond the stars. And just because it looks unlike men, you don't have to accuse it of being evil or vicious or something, maybe that expression on its face is equivalent to a resignation to fate. White is the color of mourning to the Chinese. If men can have different customs, why can't a so different race have different understandings of facial expressions? Conant laughed softly, mirthlessly. <laughs> Peaceful resignation. If that is the best it could do in the way of resignation, I should exceedingly dislike seeing it when it was looking mad. That face was never designed to express peace. It just didn't have any philosophical thoughts like peace in its makeup. I know it's your pet, but be sane about it. The thing grew up on evil. Adolescent slowly roasting alive the local equivalent of kittens and amused itself through maturity on new and ingenious torture. You haven't the slight right to say that, snapped Blair. How do you know the first thing about the meaning of a facial expression inherently inhuman? It may well have no human equivalent, whatever. That is just a different development of nature. Another example of nature's wonderful adaptability. Growing on another, perhaps harsher world, it has different form and features. But it is just as much a legitimate child of nature as you are. You are displaying the childish human weakness of hating the different. Ha! On its own world, it would probably class you as a fish belly. White monstrosity with an insufficient number of eyes and a fungoid body pale and bloated with gas. Just because its nature is different, you haven't any right to say it's necessarily evil. <laughs> Norris burst out a single explosive. Ha! He looked down at the thing. Hmm, maybe the things from other worlds don't have to be evil just because they're different. 
but that thing was. Child of nature, eh? Well, it was a hell of an evil nature. Now, will you mugs quit crabbing at each other and get the damn thing off my table? Kinner growled. Put a canvas over it. Looks indecent. <laughs> Kinner's gone. Modest, jeered Connet. Kinner slanted his eyes up to the big physicist. The scarred cheek twisted to join the line of his tight lips in a twisted grin. <laughs> All right, big boy. And what were you grousing about a minute ago? We can set the thing in a chair next to you tonight if you want. I'm not afraid of its face, Connet snapped. I don't like keeping awake over its corpse particularly, but I'm going to do it. Kinner's grin spread. Uh-huh. He went off to the galley stove and shook down ashes vigorously, drowning the brittle chipping of the ice as Blair fell to work again. Chapter 4 Cluck! reported the cosmic ray counter. Cluck! Brick! Cluck! Connet started and dropped his pencil. Damnation! The physicist looked toward the far corner, back at the Geiger counter on the table near that corner, and crawled on the desk at which he had been working to retrieve the pencil. He sat down at his work again, trying to make his writing more even. It tended to have jerks and quavers in it, in time with the abrupt proud hen noises of the Geiger counter. The muted whoosh of the pressure lamp he was using for illumination, the mingled gargles and the bugle calls of a dozen men sleeping down the corridor in Paradise House formed the background sounds for the irregular clucking noises of the counter. The occasional rustle of falling coal in the copper-bellied stove. And a soft, steady drip, drip, drip from the thing in the corner. Connet jerked a pack of cigarettes from his pocket, snapped it so that a cigarette protruded and jabbed the cylinder into his mouth. The lighter failed to function, and he pawed angrily through the pile of papers in search of a match. He scratched the wheel of the lighter several times, dropped it with a curse, and got up to pluck a hot coal from the stove with the coal tongs. The lighter functioned instantly when he tried it on returning to the desk. The counter ripped out a series of chucking guffaws as a burst of cosmic rays struck through to it. Connet turned to glower at it, and tried to concentrate on the interpretation of data collected during the past week. He began reading through the weekly summary, but he gave up and yielded to curiosity, or nervousness. He lifted the pressure lamp from the desk and carried it over to the table in the corner. Then he returned to the stove and picked up the coal tongs. The beast had been thawing for nearly 18 hours now. He poked at it with an unconscious caution. The flesh was no longer hard as armor plate, but had assumed a rubbery texture. It looked like wet, blue rubber glistening under droplets of water like little round jewels in the glare of the gasoline pressure lantern. Connet felt an unreasoning desire to pour the contents of the lamp's reservoir over the thing in its box and drop the cigarette into it. The three red eyes glared up at him sightlessly, the ruby eyeballs reflecting murky, smoky rays of light. He realized vaguely that he had been looking at them for a very long time, even vaguely understood that they were no longer sightless but it did not seem of importance. Of no more importance than the labored slow motion of the tentacular things that sprouted from the base of the scrawny, slowly pulsing neck. Connet picked up the pressure lamp and returned to his chair. He sat down, staring at the pages of mathematics before him. The clucking of the counter was strangely less disturbing, the rustle of the coals in the stove no longer distracting. The creak of the floorboards behind him didn't interrupt his thoughts as he went about his weekly report in an automatic manner, filing in columns of data and making brief summarizing notes. The creak of the floorboard sounded nearer. And that's where I will leave us this week. Tune in next week, where we will continue Who Goes There?